All right, I know, I know we still have people getting paid, but we're going to go ahead and uh, get going here. Um, first of all, I want to mention an event coming up on April 14th with uh, Professor Dueling, our very own faculty member, who's going to be speaking on uh, rapping and Facebook, um, True Threats versus Hip Hop. Um, he'll be discussing the case in Illinois versus uh, U.S. It should be a fun talk. Um, next up. Uh, Today we got Professor Josh Blackman, um, who's going to be speaking Hobby Lobby of Bomb Care and Religious Liberty. Josh is founder and president of Harlan Institute, founder of FantasyScotus.net, the internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league, and, jo and blogs at joshblackman.com. Josh is the author of Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, and over a dozen other articles about constitutional law. He's clerked for the Honorable Danny Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and for the Honorable Kim Gibson on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Josh is a graduate of the George Mason University School of Law, and um, we're pleased to be able to host him. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in Lincoln. I thank Lyle and the Federal Society for inviting me. Our discussion today is about Hobby Lobby, religious liberty, and Obamacare. And specifically, how the Affordable Care Act crashes into or intersects with rights religious liberty. So first of all, this talk is not about the Obamacare individual mandate. This is the case of NFVB versus Delius, which was decided in 2012. This was a case of whether Congress could require people to buy health insurance. If you want to learn about that, you can read my book called Unprecedented, a Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. Our focus for today is on the contraception mandate. Okay? And specifically, this is an aspect of the ACA, Obamacare, that requires employers to give contraceptives to their employees. The question is, was this compatible with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? So this may actually surprise you, for those of you who study Hobby Lobby, but the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act 2010, Obamacare, does not have a contraception mandate. The entire law, which totals nearly 3,000 pages, at no point says employers require to provide contraceptives. This may surprise you. Congress, as it often does, speaks in vague generalities. All of the law says is that with respect to certain, quote, preventative care and screenings, employers are allowed to provide it. Who defined what these preventative care and screenings are? Well, those are our health and human services, which delegate that task to the Human Resources and Service Administration, which delegated that task to a group called the Institute of Medicine. So here you have it. A group you've never heard of, called the Institute of Medicine, decided that when Congress said preventative screening, they meant the morning after pill. This is actually a very jarring aspect of the case, where the entirety of the contraceptive mandate came not from Congress, but from the bureaucracy. Anyway, here we are. <clears throat> so in 2012, the government released a regulation that said, what are these products? What are these preventative screenings? They include, quote, all FDA-approved contraceptive methods for uh, reproduction and sterilization, okay? There are quite a number of these provisions. I won't go through every single one, but needless to say, there's a couple that are quite controversial, and these are ones that not just prevent the implantation of the egg, but also, after the egg is fertilized, do something to the egg, and we can discuss exactly what that means later. But what's controversial about this law is what it does afterwards. Okay? Now, the ACA itself was sold, in large part, to young people by saying, if you have this, you can get cover, you can get health insurance. Or, this is an actual ad in Colorado, they said, you can get birth control. And for those of you who can't read it, let me read this sign to you. It says, got insurance? Let's get physical. OMG, that's oh my god for those of you who don't know. OMG, he's hot. Ready? Let's hope he is as easy to get as birth control. My health insurance covers the pill, which means all I have to worry about is getting between him and the covers. I got insurance. Okay? Thanks, Obamacare. What's this, Obama? Now, some of you may say, wow, this is an awesome ad, but I think this really represents a very cavalier attitude, right, towards the idea of providing employer sponsored birth control. So while maybe this girl wants to get between the sheets with this guy who needs life, birth control, other people may not be so crazy about it. In particular, the little sisters of the poor. 
These are a group of nuns who, as far as we know, have taken a vow of celibacy and don't have much need for birth control. Yet under the Affordable Care Act, they are required to provide it to any employees of their organization. Okay? This may surprise you, but under the original ACA as enacted, the only people who were exempt from the contraception mandate were churches. Churches, not nonprofits like the Little Sisters of the Poor. So you have these nonprofit groups of nuns, talk about nuns here, who did not want to provide contraception to their employees because they thought it was sinful. As the ACA was originally written, they were required to do so on the face of penalties. As you may imagine, this created a massive uproar. People were saying, this is crazy. Why are you requiring a group of nuns, a nonprofit organization, to provide birth control? So we have one of the first accommodations released. Okay? And what does this accommodation say? If you are a nonprofit, religiously organized, you do not need to provide birth control to your employees. Okay? But to stress, this only applied to nonprofit religious organizations like the Little Sisters of the Poor. Okay? What about for profit corporations such as the Hobby Lobby? Corporation, which is the topic of our talk today. So before we get to Hobby Lobby, let's do a little bit of history. And let's talk about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is the main statutory regime at play here. This is Al Smith. He was a Native American who worked in Oregon. His job was to be a drug counselor. Okay. Surprisingly, perhaps, he used drugs. He was a Native American, and part of his religious sacrament was to use peyote. You know, this is like a hallucinogenic mushroom, right, or a cactus or something, right? As part of his religion, he would use this drug. Unsurprisingly, as a drug counselor, he was tested for drugs, and he flunked the test. He was terminated. He was fired. Mr. Smith claimed that using this peyote was part of his religious beliefs, and that the Employment Division of Oregon could not fire him for this. This case went to the Supreme Court. In an opinion by Justice Scalia, Employment Division versus Smith, what did the court say? If you have a law of general applicability, right, a law that says no one can do drugs, even if that burden is religion, too bad. The mere fact that a law of general applicability that says you can't do drugs while you're working here harms individual religious beliefs, too bad. Okay? Now this may seem like a unfair or perhaps wrong interpretation of the First Amendment, and we can argue about that. But what happened next is fascinating. In an act of bipartisan support, President Clinton signed into law what became known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. In case you want to know, there's a young Al Gore, Chuck Schumer, and Warren Hatch. This bill was introduced by Democrats in the House. Why? Because they were very interested in protecting religious minorities, such as Native Americans. So what did this law do, this Religious Freedom Restoration Act? Well, it's not exactly clear, but at a minimum what it tried to do was to restore the First Amendment as it existed prior to employing to Bishop versus Smith. And the law works like this, okay? The government can't impose a substantial burden on religious beliefs, right? The only way they can impose this burden is if there's a compelled governmental interest and use the least restrictive means. In other words, if the government wants a burden of religious beliefs, that's for a very good reason and must do so narrowly. Okay? So this was the a law prevailing. Now, the law was eventually found invalid as applied to the states in, the city called, uh, in a case called the City of Bernie versus Flores, but it still applies to the federal government. Let's go back to our friends, the nuns, right? The Little Sisters of the Poor. What about them? Well, they argued, in short, this is a group of nuns who help poor people, mostly to help the elderly, to give them a life of dignity and care uh, later in their life. So it may surprise you that when the ACA was written, this group of nuns who organized as a nonprofit were required and obligated to provide contraceptives to their employees. This included the morning after pill. Now, this may not come as a surprise to people in Nebraska, but the Catholic Church is not in favor of the morning after pill. They oppose it very, very vigorously, but the law made no exception. So we have this, this form, right? We have this form where the government said, okay, you know what? You don't have to provide this health insurance, but tell us who your employer is, right? Tell us who your health care provider is, and we'll contact them. And provide a copy of the certificate to your health insurance company, and you won't have to pay. What did the nuns say? 
They're not saying nah. -uh. This is making us morally complicit in the provisioning of contraceptives, and we want no part of it. And what does the Supreme Court say in order? We agree. The Supreme Court, with no recorded dissent, said very clearly that the nuns cannot be required to provide the certificate to the health insurance that makes them morally complicit and imposes a substantial burden on our religious beliefs. Okay? So this is the nuns. This is somewhat of an easier case because they're not profit. What about a for-profit company? For example, Hobby Lobby. Is, is there a Hobby Lobby in Lincoln? Of course there is, right? Yes, where I grew up in New York, there were no Hobby Lobbies. That didn't exist. People don't do crafts. But I guess here in Nebraska, people like to make scrapbooks and whatever else you do at Hobby Lobby. So this is a store. They sell every type of craft you can imagine. They have stores nationwide. But one interesting aspect of this company, which has a lot of chains, is its religious identity. Okay, the store is closed on Sundays. The store provides religious counseling to their employees. Uh, the store uh, runs Christmas music and seems year round. Uh, uh, they provide uh, commercials and various religious publications. They try to outreach the community. This is, in every sense, a company owned for religion. So the founders of this company are the Green family, David and Barbara Green. Okay? And they objected to one aspect of the contract of mandate. So I want to make one point clear. They do not object to the birth control pill. They do not. They only object to four kinds of contraceptives, IUDs and various uh, contraceptives, Plan B and L. The thinking goes, again, this is somewhat disputed, these are things that act after fertilization occurs. They can actually end the, uh, basically terminate the, 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 the implanted embryo after fertilization occurs. That's all they object to. So they have no problem with most forms of birth control. There are over 16 forms of which they're fine with, sterilization, vasectomy, whatever, condoms, they pay for that. But they have objection to these four, okay? So the issue becomes, can Hobby Lobby claim protection under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and say that this law poses a burden on them? So one thing to know about Hobby Lobby is that it's not publicly traded. The company is owned by the family. This is a beautiful Easter pastel shot, but this is also the board of directors, right? The same people who are here rolling eggs and you know having you know chocolate bunnies, right? They also control the company. This is a closely held corporation where virtually everyone is of the same mind. This is not like Walmart or American Express, a massive company which has a lot of shareholders. Basically, everyone in this company is a Christian, and that's important. Okay, why is this important? Let's go back to RIFRA. I, just, I, I put forward the text of the statute before. RIFRA says the government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion. Okay? A person. So perhaps if you read just those words out of context, say, wait a minute. RIFRA only applies to people. It can't possibly apply to a corporation. But the Supreme Court has not taken such a crap view of rights. Which brings us to our next case, which is called Citizens United versus FEC. Citizens United was a 2010 case that considered whether the Federal Elections Commission could tell Citizens United, a conservative group, not to release a movie critical of Hillary Clinton. Now, whenever you heard about Citizens United, I'll echo what Larry Tribe said recently. At bottom, this case represented an effort by the government to tell a company you cannot release a movie. Okay. Whatever the corruption, anything else, the government told someone you cannot release this movie. During oral arguments in this case, recall that Justin Lito asked one question. Could the government ban a book critical of a candidate before an election? Could the government ban a book? Do I know what Malcolm Stewart, the government lawyer, said? Yes. So whatever you think about Citizens United, whatever you've been told, keep in mind the government said they could ban movies, and ban books. These cases cannot possibly be correct. So even if you disagree with the reasoning, the outcome, I think, is, is, is right. But one aspect of Citizens United that's driven people batty is this idea of corporate personhood, corporate rights, the idea that the corporation you know, owns the Constitution, that the justices are just shills for, uh, uh, you know, like, like, like NASCAR drivers wearing like their jumpsuits with every single brand and icon on it, right? By the way, your, your favorite court hustler fan right here, Justice Thomas, he's a, uh, he's a fan of Nebraska, so it's good to be here as well. So it's really um, a difficult argument to rebut because it's kind of silly. 
Um, corporations are made up of people. If people choose to associate with corporate form, they usually don't give up their right to speak. Uh, uh, look no further than a case called New York Times versus Sullivan. The New York Times, a for-profit corporation, availed itself of free speech rights. I could go on and on. Corporations, the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, I could keep going. Corporations have availed themselves of various constitutional rights. This is, it, it's almost a specious smokescreen, but that's not my goal for today. Right? My goal for today is how does this intersect with Hobby Lobby? Hobby Lobby, the opponent said, represents the idea of giving corporates religious right. right? How can a corporation possibly exercise religious freedom, the argument goes? This is ridiculous. Well, if you think about what a corporation is, a group of people, it's actually not so crazy. So before I begin, uh, one of my favorite aspects of big Supreme Court cases involving abortion and stuff is you have these excellent protest signs. And this is a few of my favorites. So if, you have, if you've never been to the Supreme Court, you should go. So this one's my favorite. If men can get pregnant, birth control will be from gumbo machines and be bacon flavored. Okay. This is not a healthcare plan, be holy Bible. Okay. This woman is dressed up like birth control pills. I guess she had a uh, couple extra M&Ms or something made like uh, this line. Okay. These signs say, hey, Supreme Court, no bosses in my bedroom. I'm fairly certain that Hobby Lobby would agree with it, saying, yes, we don't want to be in your bedroom. We don't have to pay for your birth control. So I think this sign was a little bit uh, off message. Again, contraceptive is my business. Very well, then pay for it yourself. Okay? And, and then our favorite, corporations are not people, my friend. Now, this woman, I think, was the best. That's actually a crochet uterus. <laughs> I'm serious. And that sign says, Hobby Lobby, this uterus is for you. I think she went to Joanne's by the, by the, by the uh, yard. I don't, I don't know if she bought that yard at Hobby Lobby. I'm just, just guessing here. You get it? Keep your hobbies off my ovaries. And OK. So we have here the people who want to have team life for life. And then my favorite, God's all come first, repeal social Obamacare. These guys are always there for the bad lives. Anyway. <laughs> So into the Supreme Court we go. The signs are a nice vignette of how people see the case outside the law. So it's, it's actually a very good exercise. So we go to the Supreme Court, and once again, for the second time in a row, Paul Clement, there's a gentleman on your right, who we argue on behalf of the challengers, and then Donald Burley, the Solicitor General, who we argue on behalf of the government. Not only two years earlier, they argued the Obamacare case, and they are back in court arguing again. So the arguments when the bad as you expected them to go. One of the big questions was, could a corporation exercise religious freedom? So this argument is actually a lot easier than you may think, and I'll give you a couple examples, right? So the Solicitor General asked a question of the government. He's, I'm sorry, the Justice Alito asked a question of the government. He said, well, what happens if you have a kosher butcher? One of this, like, so it's a, it's a way of sacrificing animals in, in, in a ritual manner for the Jewish faith. What if you had a large incorporated kosher butcher and the government passed a law saying butchers are not allowed to use this manner of slaughter? Okay? They have to use a stun gun, for example. Under the rules of kosher, that animal will no longer be able to be edible by Jews. Okay? And the Solicitor General basically said, well, the corporation could not bring a challenge to this. People who eat the food can bring it. But Alito pressed back and said, wait a minute. You're telling a corporation of Jewish rabbis that they are not allowed to follow their religion and slaughter animals. And the Swiss General didn't have a good response to this. Because the entire nation that you surrender, the entire notion that you surrender your religious rights when you incorporate it, it is difficult to comprehend. So actually at this point, although it was a 5-4 decision, Justices Breyer and Kagan didn't join along in the dissent. They basically were silent on this issue. I think they even conceded that corporations in certain contexts can have these religious beliefs. The more important question was about how much of a burden is this? In other words, by requiring Hobby Lobby to provide these contraceptives, how much are they burdening their religious liberties? I mean, all they're having to do is pay for these products. They don't have to actually give them the birth control. They don't have to perform the abortions themselves. They're simply paying for a plan in which a person could use to acquire these products. Is that a burden? The court split on this. I think the Solicitor General had a very tough time because he made an important concession. He said, listen, I'm going to agree that the, that the Green family has a good faith objection to providing birth control. I will agree at that point. But making them pay for it does not violate this belief. Well, this argument doesn't work very well 
Because if you're requiring someone to pay for something they find burdensome, I think that's almost by definition a burden on the religious beliefs. You are priming them to facilitate the provision of drugs they object to. And this part of the opinion I think is fairly uncontroversial, but for the fact that it involves something like birth control, which has become such a cultural issue in today's society. So here we come to the decision in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, that's what we came to be called. The majority opinion was announced by Justice Alito. And for those of you who know at home, when you follow the Supreme Court, you watch the SCOTUS blog, say, oh wow, Justice Alito has a majority opinion. I imagine this was President Obama's reaction when he heard that Alito had a majority opinion. He was like, oh, crap, right? Uh, so the majority opinion by Justice Alito effectively said, listen, this is simple, right? This is not, I think uh, my, my colleague may make a similar point. This case should have been a lot more unanimous than it was. The fact that people who incorporate have religious identities is nothing new. Corporation had free speech rights for a long time, long before since United. And Lito makes a simple point. Making the corporation pay for a form of birth control that terminates an embryo is a serious burden on their religious beliefs. And Lito made this point. If this is so important, right? If this is such a compelling interest, why does the government pay for it itself? Right? Why doesn't the government just simply pay for these contraceptives out of its own pocket, the same way they did with the Little Sisters of the Poor? If this is so important, let the corporations opt out. Okay? Now we had a dissent by Justice Ginsburg, and who took this issue very personally. So Justice Ginsburg first said, and by the way, I'll give you a pro tip about Justice Ginsburg. She's very fond of wearing these neck collars, which are called jabos. And I've actually coined the word neck doily. Uh, uh, if you've seen her wearing these, it's like a teacup, right? So I call these neck doilies. And in fact, in the next edition of Black's Law Dictionary, the word neck doily is in there. That's me. OK. <laughs> so I, I, I've peaked. I've now coined the word Black's Dictionary. But Justice Ginsburg has a special jabot for dissenting. This is her dissent jabot. She says it looks very fierce, anyway. So if you ever go to the court, and RBG is wearing a gold neck collar, you know she's in dissent, anyway. So what did Ginsburg say? She made this point of saying that, listen, we have these rights, but they can't infringe on the rights of other women, okay? I think this, this is misguided. Of course women have a constitutional right to birth control, we saw this in Griswold in Connecticut, and Roe v. Wade and in Casey, the right to abortion. But they don't have the right for someone to pay for it. And this is a fundamental disconnect that's so uh, uh, glaring. This idea that you have a right that someone's paid for your birth control is not true. No matter what Obamacare says, you do not have a right to birth control. You simply don't. Obamacare is a law that penalizes employers who fail to do so, but does not create a substantive right. And I think, and perhaps fear, that going forward, people will start to assume that Obamacare is actually some sort of fundamental right, and any attempt to take it away violates some sort of due process right. The government actually made this argument. Justice Ginsburg makes another point. Say, listen, what happens if you know, your employer is a Christian scientist who opposes vaccines, or doesn't want to pay the minimum wage to women? Well, with respect, this doesn't happen. Right? One of the reasons why Hobby Lobby was so significant was an unprecedented move. You were requiring people to provide the birth control. Justice Ginsburg had to cite some cases from the 70s and 80s where people wouldn't hire someone because they were women. Right? This doesn't happen today. But requiring them to provide birth control is a serious issue. Uh, Justice Ginsburg says, I fear we venture into a minefield. Right? Uh, I think that's largely overblown. I think the subsequent aftermath of Hobby Lobby confirms that her, her fears were not particularly well grounded. Anyway, so after the case, the pro-lifers were high-fiving, uh, you know, they, they, they were cheering, and the media went crazy. They said, you know, we, we've now replaced we the people with we the corporations, and we've given these corporations the power to deny women their birth control. And that now all of these uh, big corporate Excuse me, big corporations like Microsoft will have religious identities and fire one who's you know, not religious. Uh, HR departments will begin just denying services and you know, corporations or churches. Uh, all these memes, I think, are totally wrong. What made Hobby Lobby unique was a closely held corporation. It was privately held. Give me any publicly traded company where at a shareholder meeting they will agree to block birth control benefits. It won't happen. The only companies where this will happen, where everyone in the board director is of one mind with respect to faith. Okay? 
So in my closing time, I want to discuss a little bit about our favorite Justice Ginsburg, her actually become known the Notorious RBG, which is a pun on the Notorious B.I.G. Uh, who, if you don't know, he was a rapper, uh, Christopher Wallace, who was killed by Tupac, basically, right? So, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, uh, too soon, too soon? <laughs> is he still alive anyway? Okay, so, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg is taken to this notorious RPG meme. And I think in many respects, she's become kind of a cultural warrior. We have all these memes, we put Beyonce lyrics, and a picture of Justice Ginsburg, and think you're cool, right? So these, these are everywhere, right? Uh, uh, where Justice Ginsburg's become this paragon of the women's rights movement, which she was for many years. But I want to discuss with you is why I think this is dangerous. Okay, the reason I think this is dangerous is when we start glamorizing the justice, it becomes very difficult to separate the justice from the movement. So when Justice Ginsburg becomes this, the, the, this icon of the women's rights movement, uh, and people having these t-shirts, uh, it becomes difficult to separate Justice Ginsburg from the notorious RBG. And any time you know, she's in dissent and you know, someone else in the majority, it becomes like a matter of sexism. It becomes part of this war on women. In fact, after Hobby Lobby was decided, you have all these memes saying these five men. By the way, Senator Harry Reid of Nevada said Hobby Lobby is by five white men. That would come as a surprise to Justice Thomas. <laughs> but anyway, you have this meme saying, <laughs> yeah, these memes saying all these white men are taking away rights from women. Um, and this is dangerous, right? Of course there are, you know, six men, three men on the court, and, you know, who knows the correct number is. But it's a very, uh, I think, destructive approach of saying any decision where, you know, men vote take away rights from women is as much of sexism. These are conservative justices, right? Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, Justice Lee are conservative justices. They view the law in a certain way. And I think we should look at it as a fact of jurisprudence and not as a matter of sexism. Okay. By the way, this, this portrait of the female justices uh, makes Justice Kagan uh, not look good. Uh, Justice Sotomayor looks, looks really good, Justice Kagan looks very frumpy. It's not a, it's not a good look. And oh, what about Breyer? So Dolly Lewithick had the back clean up, he called the fourth feminist, right, whatever. So what happens then? So after Hobby Lobby, you know, does the Supreme Court go home for the summer and just chill? No, we have very, very quick action. So in a case called Wheaton College, it's a Christian university in Illinois, they objected to providing birth controls. Within days after Hobby Lobby, I think it was like three or four days later, the Supreme Court issued an order that this university is not required to provide contraceptives. They only need to uh, 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 notify the insurance company about this. Mind you, this was the exact same order given to the Little Sisters of the Poor a year earlier. But now, after Hobby Lobby, Justice Sotomayor issued a vigorous sense saying, this is ridiculous, right? How is this after Hobby Lobby, where we just said that the, uh, that the government can pay for this it is an accommodation? Now we're saying they can't even do that. What I wanted to draw to you is, this was the language of the Little Sister Order. And this is the language of the Wheaton College Order. The first one was joined by nine justices. The second was five to four. They are verbatim. Look at the language. They're the exact same thing. So the exact same remedy that was given to the Little Sisters of the Poor was given to Wheaton College. I don't understand the moral outrage from Justice Sotomayor and Ginsburg about this subsequent order. Anyway, this detente didn't last long. So there was a new compromise that was reached. Okay, what is this new compromise? Everybody gets the Little Sisters of the Poor solution. If you're a for-profit corporation or a non-profit corporation, you are not required to pay for this. All you have to do is send a letter just a letter to your insurance company saying, we don't want to do this. Unsurprisingly, this compromise didn't work. And various religious groups <coughs> said, this won't work for us. And they filed subsequent cases. This case will go back to the Supreme Court probably fairly soon, in the next year or so, challenging whether it's still a burden to require them to write a letter, whether that's too much. Uh, but for now, we've learned a lot about Hobby Lobby, uh, Obamacare, Religious Liberty. Um, I thank you all for your attention, and I welcome your, your thoughts on it. Thank you all so much. Well, that was a, that was a great job. You even stole my joke about the five white males. Uh, I, use the, I, I speak on Hobby Lobby quite a bit myself. Um, and what I want to do, I want to kind of go with the aftermath and talk about a case called Hope versus Hobbs, the, the Muslim beard case. But before I get there, I just want to sort of uh, uh, support 
uh, a lot of what uh, Professor Blackman said uh, about um, uh, about particularly about the the idea that corporations are persons within the meaning of RIFRA. One thing he didn't mention, I'm sure he was aware of it and and just didn't mention it, is that Congress has actually passed something. Congress has passed something called the Dictionary Act. And the Dictionary Act provides that in determining the meaning of any act of Congress, for example, RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, unless the context indicates otherwise, the word person includes corporations, companies, associations, firms, partnerships, societies, and joint stock companies, as well as individuals. So Congress itself has provided a, uh, a, a definition section that basically defines what persons means within all acts of Congress, including RIFRA. So that issue was, was a really easy issue. And I, I think part of the reason why there's been so much um, strident reaction against Hobby Lobby is something I refer to as Citizens United Road Rage, that there's a part of the, of, of the body politic that, that just recoils at the very notion that corporations have rights. Um, and so I think they, they basically growl when, when somebody says corporations have rights. And, and you know when you respond, well, corporations are made up of people, they growl all the more, you know, grrr. It's kind of like road rage, but it just relates to this idea of corporate personhood, I think. So that's one uh, additional point I wanted to make. The second one, on the substantial burden test. So once a corporation is a person, the question is, does the contraceptive mandate impose a substantial burden on that person's exercise of religion? Their exercise of religion was pretty clear. They, they objected to any facilitation of these four forms of contraception, which they considered to be abortifacients. And so the question is, how much pressure does government put on them to basically go against their religious beliefs? And the answer is that under Obamacare, under the contraceptive mandate, if you don't provide all of the FDA-approved contraception in your policy, then a corporation or anyone who's subject to the law must pay a penalty of $100 per day for each employee covered by the plan. And so in Hobby Lobby's case, that was a penalty of $475 million a year. That is a corporate death penalty is what that amounts to. They, they could not have survived that penalty for more than a year or two. Apple might be able to hold out for a decade, but Hobby Lobby would have died as a corporation if they had to pay that penalty. So it is pretty clear that the contraceptive mandate imposed a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a corporate person. Um, and so I, I, when I do this talk, my, my argument is that, uh, or my, my, my insight is, that I think Hobby Lobby was not only correctly decided, I, I'd say it ought to, under the law, if we could just get away from the culture war background, the fact that this was religion versus contraception and abortion, if you can get out of the, 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 the culture war background, this case should have been unanimous. It should have been 9 nothing on the law. Dictionary Act person, $475 million a year penalty, compelling interest, penalty, but in any event, there's a clearly a less restrictive means of accomplishing the compelling interest of making sure that women get free contraception through the, you know, through the uh, mandate, through the uh, requirement that insurance companies simply pick it up on a cost-free basis because it doesn't cost the insurance companies anything to provide the free contraceptive coverage because what they lose in payment for contraceptives, they gain back by not having to pay uh, maternity coverage and things like that for un unplanned pregnancies. So it should have been nine nothing, but it was only five four, those five white males. <laughs> Uh, but uh, maybe it's nine nothing now. The Supreme Court decided another important religious liberty case in January of this year, just a couple months ago. The case is called Holt versus Hobbs, and it concerned Riffra's sister law, our LUPA, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which provides that government may not substantially burden the religious exercise of an imprisoned person unless the government demonstrates that the burden constitutes the least, restric least restrictive means of furthering the compelling state interest. So it is exactly the same substantial burden, and if there's a substantial burden, compelling interest. This is a so-called Muslim beard case that you may have heard about. And basically, the facts are pretty simple. The prisoner Gregory Holt, also known as Abdul Malik Muhammad, 
is a devout Muslim who wished to grow a one-half inch beard, about the length of my beard, uh, based upon his sincerely held religious beliefs. This, by the way, is not a religious beard. This is, I'm just styling with this beard. Uh, but his beard was grown for, <laughs> his beard was grown for religious reasons. And Arkansas prison regula regulations prohibited beards based upon concerns involving prison security. Uh, we can't allow prisoners to have beards because they can hide contraband in their ears, in their, uh, in their hair, in their beards. They might be able to hide a weapon or a needle or some drugs or something like that. Uh, and plus, we need to know what they look like when they're clean shaven in case they escape. So we just have one rule, no beards at all. But there was one exception. Medical beards were permitted. So if you have a uh, sort of a dermatological uh, condition that, that makes it difficult for you to shave, they did allow medical beards, but no religious beards. So the case goes before the Supreme Court, and Mr. Holt uh, is, uh, is basically saying, look, this violates my rights under our lupa. This is a substantial burden on my religious liberty. He filed this case pro se, by the way, uh, ended up getting counsel before the Supreme Court, but he initially filed this case on his own. Case gets before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court unanimously, nine to zero, held that Holt was entitled to a religious exemption from the no beard prison grooming policy. I think this is a harder case than Hobby Lobby, but it, yet it comes out unanimously. The court held that Holt had easily satisfied his burden of establishing a substantial burden on religious freedom because the regulation required him to choose between shaving his beard, which violated his religion on the one hand, or facing serious disciplinary action on the other. Just like the contraceptive mandate required Hobby Lobby to choose between violating its religious beliefs against funding contraceptives on the one hand, or paying a $475 million corporate death tax penalty. Basically the same kind of substantial burden analysis. And the court said, this is an easy case. Clearly there's a substantial burden here. So now, the, now the, the burden switches to government to show that they have a compelling justification for imposing a substantial burden on Holt's religious liberty. And Alito emphasized the compelling interest test is a rigorous standard that is difficult to meet. This is not like the rational basis test. The compelling interest test requires an interest, uh, an, uh, an interest of the highest order, a compellingly important governmental interest is what's required and least restrictive means. And the court said, well, you know, maybe there's a compelling interest in prison security. We're worried about prisoners uh, hiding contraband in their beards. It's a little hard to think how I'd hide a gun in this half-inch beard, <laughs> or, or even a needle. I might be able to get a needle in there, I don't know. But uh, they, they kind of made fun about that and said, well, this is only a half an inch beard that we're talking about. Kind of hard to imagine. Too much contraband uh, being hidden here. Uh, but they also had a concern that they wanted to, they wanted prisoners to be cleanly shaven so they'd know what they looked like in case they escaped or if they tried to, to sneak into a, you know, a different part of the prison where they weren't allowed to be. So they had very powerful prison security concerns. Um, but the court said, look, even if that's compelling, there's a least restrictive means that's involved. If we're worried about Duncan hiding weapons in his beard, then the guards could comb through his beard, or they could require him to comb through his beard. Give me a little comb, I'll comb through my beard. If there's an AK-47 in there, it'll fall out with, when I go with the comb. If I'm hiding you know, a kilo of drugs in there, it'll come out when I comb my, my face. So that's a less, least restrictive means, just as the alternative way of getting the coverage for the women, having the insurance companies directly provide it, was a less restrictive means in Hobby Lobby. Uh, and then, but what about if I escape and they need to know what I look like in a clean shaven condition? So we need, we need the grooming policy just in case the prisoner escapes or tries to sneak into another area of the prison. We need to know what he looks like in a clean shaven aqua velva kind of look. Uh, and again, there's a less restrictive means. The court said, well, you know, you could take a picture of the prisoner, make him shave once, take a picture of him clean shaven, take one with a beard, and then you know what he looks like either way. And you can make those 
pictures available to the guards. If he breaks out of prison, you can make those available in some kind of an all points bulletin or something like that. And you know there's even an easier, less restrictive means of doing this without having to make me shave once. You could take a picture of me with a beard and then get, you know, then Photoshop and get those IT guys to come in and give me a nice virtual shave. And then you'll know what I look like with the beard. You'll know what I look like in my aqua velma clean shave and look. And either way, you'll have a less restricted means of protecting that security interests. Um, and so the court held unanimously. They struck down the no beard policy insofar as it prevents Holt from growing a one half inch beard in accordance with his religious beliefs. Well, I suggest that the legal analysis in Hobby Lobby and Holt are identical. Uh, and in fact, if one of the cases is easier than the other, I think Hobby Lobby is easier to decide in favor of religious liberty than Holt is. Because prisons are dangerous places, and there really is a very strong interest in making sure that, you know, that, that we deal with security concerns and potential violence and potential escapes and things like that. Uh, but nevertheless, I think Holt was right. Holt comes out 9 nothing in favor of religious liberty. I think Hobby Lobby should have. And I suggest that the difference in the two cases is that Hobby Lobby is a battle in the culture war over abortion and contraception. Uh, whereas Holt concerns a Muslim prisoner in a battle with prison officials over, over a beard. And all culture war cases, cases involving abortion or contraception or gay rights are ideologically divisive. Uh, and they all end up as 5-4 decisions. This marriage case that's coming down in a few months, it's going to be a 5-4 decision. I would absolutely almost guarantee that. I don't know which way. Tell me what Kennedy's going to do, and I'll tell you how it comes out. But all of these cases are 5-4. And I think that's the reason why Hobby Lobby was 5-4. Not because it's a hard case. It's an easy case under the law, under RFRA. I think it's, it came down 5-4 because it, it gets us involved in this country, in this culture war, in this sort of the war on women, women's rights to access contraception. And of course, Women always had total access to contraception, as Professor Blackman points out. The question was who pays, whether the employer must pay or whether women must pay for their own contraceptives. No one was denying women. Hobby Lobby was not de denying its female employees the right to go purchase contraception with their own money. It simply said, we've got serious religious liberty objections to these sort of uh, abortifacient forms of contraception. And then just one last point. Um, if the next mandate were a real abortion mandate, suppose that Obamacare required all insurance policies to cover surgical abortions all the way throughout pregnancy. First trimester, second trimester, and even third trimester, surgical abortions must be covered under a policy. If Hobby Lobby had come out the other way, then the abortion mandate would have, would have come out the other way as well. If Hobby Lobby doesn't have a free exercise right to object to the contraceptive mandate, then it would also not have a religious liberty right to object to the abortion mandate. So there's a slippery slope on both sides of this. On the one hand, the dissent is worrying about things like vaccinations and, and blood transfusions, something that I don't think is likely to happen. But if it had come down the other way, I'd be worried about an abortion mandate and basically telling employers, if you go into business and incorporate, get ready, you're going to have to subsidize abortion. We don't care if you're Catholic. We don't care what your religious beliefs are. You're going to have to subsidize abortion because there is no religious freedom right for for-profit corporations. So that's all I have. Uh, but I'm sure Professor Blackman is ready to take your questions. All right, we have some time for questions. Oh, that's it. Slipper slope seems to be more on hold in the sense that when we're dealing with Catholicism, there's one authority. The vast majority of Muslims don't subscribe to the idea that you need a beard. So what do we do on each one of these cases? Well, I think what the government's position was is they're not challenging the sincerity of the beliefs, right? They didn't challenge that the inmate had a sincere belief that he required to a beard. They didn't challenge that the Greed family, the Hopper Lobby Corporation, opposed contraceptive. They conceded that. But I don't know, I'm interested in what he has to say. I can imagine in a future case where the government does challenge the center saying, wait a minute, this is not an actual teaching of your religious belief. You don't need a beard. And that makes litigation in a very different tenor when the government's deciding 
what is is not a correct option to believe. Uh, yeah, I, and I'll say this, free, free exercise rights do not depend upon your beliefs being the same as the beliefs even of the church that you attend. There's a case, of, of one of the unemployment com, uh, uh, compensation cases, it's called Frazee. And that was a case where the guy attended a church that didn't practice Saturday Sabbath observance, but his personal reading of the Bible was that he was bound to observe Saturday as his Sabbath. And the court said it's his religious freedom that we're protecting. It doesn't depend upon what his pastor says or what the Pope says or anything else. It may well be that that will support you if you are a, uh, a Catholic who wants to support the teachings of the church. That would strengthen your claim that you've got a sincere religious objection, but but in theory, this is, it's a very individualized version of what, and, and in fact, in, in the contraceptive mandate cases, there are some religious objectors who object to all forms of contraception, and some like Hobby Lobby that only object to some of them, the, the four abortifacient types of contraception. And so it's a very individualized thing. Your religious beliefs are what you believe in, and those are the ones that are protected when you litigate. My religious beliefs are what I believe in, and those are the ones that are protected when I make it. I guess I have a question, and I don't know who the right person is to answer it. But what's the Federalist Society's position on corporations? The Federal Society takes no positions. We're speaking as individuals. Right. But they sponsored uh, a number of uh, lectures here. And I'm trying to figure out if the founding fathers, you said that this right goes way back. Well, it doesn't go way back to the founding fathers, does it? Well, I mean, so first of all, the federal side takes no official positions on stuff, so I can speak for myself and he can speak for himself. Uh, but the Supreme Court case law on the First Amendment rights of corporation goes back at least the 20th century. There wasn't much of a First Amendment before the 20th century. There was no case about this. But in many case after case, you see the Supreme Court saying corporations in the New York Times have rights. So I don't think this is a particularly controversial uh, uh, notion. Well, there wasn't corporations back in the founding fathers of no. the Constitution. Sure, there have been corporations for well before the United States existed. Okay. Well, other questions? Yes, sir. I'd just like to ask you two personally, do you believe that there is a fundamental right for every American to have health care provided to do them? No. In some form, okay. No. Um, Not a constitutional right. It's totally only, only rich people should live then, or people who can afford it should have the right to live. Well, our Constitution is not one of positive rights. If you look at our Constitution with the Bill of Rights, of course, there are restrictions on government. Government can't do this, can't do that, can't allow due process, can't allow protection. Our Constitution does not afford positive rights. What life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without life and liberty to live that life through proper health care, I mean, one could argue that those two rights are being violated. It's not a very good right because it's one of negative. The government doesn't get in your ways for you to pursue happiness. They're not supposed to pay for you to get there. Right. This is a European constitutional sense that you have these positive rights, right, to housing rights, to education rights, to health care rights, to, uh, you know, minimum wage. Those are fine in various continental constitutions, but that is not consistent with our tradition. I see people packing up, so we have one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I saw that, um, I just looked at the opinion again, and uh, just as Kagan and Breyer just said, we think plaintiffs fail on the merits, we don't need to reach uh, whether the corporation can bring a claim. Um, I'm not satisfied with that. I'm just curious. Um, they, they seem to part with Ginsburg, but what was their approach to the case on the merits? Why they, the I mean, on the merits, they thought Hobby Lobby loses, right? So, well, what element within the RIPRA claim did they thought that? Well, I, 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 I'm pretty sure they joined the portion of Ginsburg's opinion about this is the burden, and this is not a substantial burden. Okay. Right, but, but, but you make a good point, right? Ginsburg, I'm sorry, Kagan and Breyer didn't join the opinion that said that corporations cannot exercise rights in the They also didn't say they do. They, they were just silent on it. So by being silent on it, there were only two votes from that position. Uh, I don't know quite why they did that, but I think they probably thought things were going too far. Who knows? Well, and they also, I, I think the entire dissent thought that there was a compelling interest in providing access, paid access to women for, con uh, for contraception. And that there wasn't an adequate, the proposed less restrictive means wasn't an adequate less restrictive means. The government didn't have to go down that path. Uh, again, I think that's not giving much impact to the compelling interest test, which is supposed to mean that the interest must be one of over. And as Professor Blackman pointed out, the contraceptive mandate never passed Congress. 
right? The, if you think about it, health care is at the outer edge of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause, if it's there at all. And the contraceptive mandate is at the outer edge of what's covered by Obamacare. Obamacare was mostly about covering the, un the uninsured, those who were completely uninsured. It wasn't about uh, the contraceptive mandate. And indeed, if the contraceptive mandate had been specifically proposed in the text of the statute rather than kicked over to HHS, it would not have passed. Obamacare did not pass with a, passed with not a single vote to spare. And if they had had a vote on the contraceptive mandate, including Plan B and L, it would, they would have lost votes. It would not have passed at all. So how can we say that a law that would not have passed if it was honestly uh, placed before Congress is a compelling interest of the national government, an interest of overriding importance? Yeah, can an administrative agency determine what a compelling interest is? That's what Justice Kennedy raised, which is a really tough question. <coughs> a bunch of bureaucrats are on land inside what a compelling interest is when Congress was silent, right? And they were intentionally silent. Oh, very, very much. The so. reason they used that women's preventative care language was a cover. It was a smokescreen, uh, because they knew if they had been honest and said, "Well, let's vote on contraception," the whole bill would have been voted. Then. And then we have no Obamacare. So on that happy note, I, I would end, <laughs> and I thank you all very much for your attention. And, uh,